What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to episode nine of the Extreme Drummers podcast. We are back after a week off. I keep saying we. It's just me, as always. Um, I am back after a week off. Sorry about last week. Uh, had a crazy couple of weeks uh, with with life. Tried to get something ready and out for last week. It just didn't work. So, um, uh, so I moved it to this week. Managed to announce the 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 t-shirts that I've got there. The podcast t-shirts. Thanks to absolutely everybody who's already picked one up. Um, there's still a few left, so anybody who is interested in treating themselves to a nice little Extreme Drivers Podcast t-shirt, then just head over to extremedriverspodcast.com. It's all on there. You can also listen to the podcast on there as well. Um, but yeah, so this week, episode nine, we are with the awesome James Stewart from Vader, Decapitated, um and a million other projects which i can't even remember this dude is is so busy he even managed to double book himself last year in the middle of the pandemic so um yeah james is a incredible drummer absolutely incredible drummer plays for some legendary bands um and yeah just uh as always a really cool chat really nerdy we get into it on this one getting pretty deep into a bunch of different things um yeah and funny one because um couple of weeks ago james was doing a session um not massively far away from where i live and he needed an 18 inch tom didn't have an 18 inch tom his uh, his drums were stuck uh somewhere and um yeah so he came over and and borrowed a tom from me an 18 inch tom for this recording session so funnily enough um he's one of the only people that i've seen in real life one of the kind of one of my only drumming kind of friends that i've seen in real life in a long 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 time so and it prompted this uh this chat on the podcast so it was um so it was so it's cool but yeah so again really cool chat as always i really hope you guys enjoy it as always thanks to everybody who's still listening and yeah as always keep up to date on instagram extreme drums podcast or downloading drum facebook it's downloading drum for updates. Uh, YouTube search Extreme Drummers Podcast, and now the newly updated and renovated Extreme Drummers Podcast dot com. You can listen to it all on there and keep up to date on there. Uh, but yeah, as always, thanks so much. I really hope you enjoy this episode. And yeah, here we go, episode nine, James Stewart. How are you, man? How's things? I'm all, I'm all right. I'm all right. I've been sitting around now for a little while, which has been nice. That must be weird it, <laughs> for you. <laughs> it is fucking horrible. Yeah, it's really, really hard. I've, I've, because I knew it was, I knew it was coming because I've been yeah. building up to this, this sort of two month period, especially. Wow, two months. I've been this particular, um, as in March and March and April. You know, yeah. doing the doing. The decap recording and then and then this oh shit sorry one. so the two months of crazy busy sorry yeah sorry yeah yeah they were they basically have been put on at the end of what has been an, an insanely busy lockdown period <laughs> and so <laughs> i know it's a very it's, very weird thing to it's say the opposite <laughs> of people. i think like 97 percent of people <laughs> yeah so i i gotta be really careful when i complain <laughs> a lot of people listening would just be thinking you bastard. <laughs> That's really good though, man. And is it like so from kind of no I don't want to say day one, but from kind of the start of this whole thing last last year, were you relatively relatively pretty, busy? Pretty early on. Yeah. Um because I, I basically had it had a break planned mm. uh starting slightly after when um when the first lockdowns were yeah were happening so i was i was meant to sort of take a break i think around april may okay um last year this is yeah uh 2020 yeah yeah uh but as it happened <laughs> lockdown got called and i had to interrupt we got a tour interrupted sent home God. so i so the break started in march instead but i already had a plan for you know kind of setting up um my own home recording setup mm. much much like you've got and quite a few other drummers have, have got getting into the engineering stuff and mm. working on doing more home recordings and things like that so actually having the lockdown meant that i wasn't losing any work because no one had any 
Yeah, firstly, and yeah. I could just just <laughs> just focus on that. And I've always been worried about taking a long break to do something else mm. because of what it means in lost work. Yeah, absolutely. You, you know what? It's, any freelancer knows that. You know, it's you can't say no. You have to say no. Uh, you have to say yes to everything. Pr- well, not really, you know, within reason. Everything that kind of comes your way. Yeah, yeah, and and especially if you do take time off, you know that that work is going to get done, just not by you. Yeah, absolutely. And you absolutely. and it the way we always get get our work is you you did aborted and then that led on to other things with carcass and stuff so exactly so you never know what's going to come or something and mm. so there's always that fomo yeah <laughs> yeah basically absolutely. absolutely yeah basically and um you know i actually i don't feel any sense of like crazy competition with with guys like you or, mm. or mm. craig or or ali or, it's kind or of Krim a- or anyone it's we all seem like to avoid community. each other. Yeah, in yeah, a, in a nice way. To, in a nice way. <laughs> no one's really stepping on toes work-wise. Mm, mm, um, absolutely. So I don't. I'm not. I don't panic about it. But mm. also, I'm just like, ah, oh, that gig look looks like it would have been cool. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know. I totally, I totally agree. Did you have any kind of like? Um, when it first happened, I know you you plan to take time off anyway. But when it first happened, did you have any kind of? um initial you know did you have that kind of mourning period where you were like oh gigs are gone or were you kind of like thank fuck i can actually take some time i was <laughs> man in the in yeah i was absolutely i was i was kind of bummed because you know of course the money lost money of course yeah yeah but um fuck man it was my first time at home in <laughs> a decade <laughs> about about uh not not far off yeah uh i think it was my first extended period of not touring in yeah seven eight years wow so it was it was really nice to have a kind of forced break and also not uh, and also i didn't feel like i was losing anything out to other to other people you know especially i feel more of a band competition than a personal musician competition so if i if I'm if I'm not touring and I see other bands around me, yeah, yeah. touring and and doing yeah. stuff, then then I get more bummed out. Yeah, if, I know what you mean. I'm drummers. like, we should be on tour. What the fuck are we doing? <laughs> yeah, or like you yeah. know, if I I saw you know the the posters for the for Carcass doing some some tour like the tour with Voivod back in the oh, day. Oh yeah, that was sick. Yeah, or, with, or, uh, or like yeah. the Behemoth Arch Enemy type yeah. type deal. I see Carcass on a poster, but I'd be like. Oh, fuck we should be doing that well, <laughs> yeah. and i get more annoyed about that than, yeah uh, absolutely than the individual people doing the individual, individual things. yeah yeah yeah, yeah I, I don't, I don't think that. that i don't i'm not sitting there thinking that dan's a prick going on tour <laughs> having fun <laughs> yeah no i know what you mean i totally know what you mean and i think uh, also because i was similar to you because i've realized relatively early on in the, the whole lockdown thing that um that was the most time i'd had at home since i was you know 18 or 19 or something like that which is great and obviously similar for you as well and it's and i think the thing that really helped me i wonder if it helped you as well was everyone was in the same boat <laughs> so yeah, yeah totally, there was no totally. point in being sad because it's like oh well everyone's dealing with this so who yeah, am i yeah. to so be I, sad I was, yeah i was i was stuck at home um with my girlfriend her sister two cats everything so it was it was kind of it was actually kind of nice just having everyone together and then mm. um uh, and that was and that was cool. And then things opened up in Poland quite quickly. There was like mm. a, we had like a month of a serious lockdown, starting just before the UK went into yeah. a serious lockdown. And then things started opening up again, and I could actually get into the practice room, so I started jamming again, and was able to very slowly kind of get my shit together with the with the microphones. Yeah, and huge. I should t- I take every opportunity to say thanks to SE Electronics, man, because they sorted me out big time. <laughs> Which is anybody your whole project, I'm sure, massively. <laughs> I, it, w- it wouldn't have got off the ground mm. at all without wow. without them. I don't think because it was mm. just. I well, you know, man. If you every time you buy a microphone, you just kind of weep a little bit. Yeah, and, <laughs> and it's one of that like without being without sounding kind of mean to microphone uh, manufacturers, but it's one of those purchases where it's like. It's not the most exciting purchase, but it's totally necessary. Mm. <laughs> Do you know what I mean, like, I mean, it kind of, it, it kind of is for me a little bit because I. Um, are you turning I, into I, one I of those a, people? No, I've always, <laughs> I've always been a bit, I've always been a bit like 
anyway because yeah. yeah. I, I always like that was my favorite bit about music tech lessons actually was setting yeah. up the microphones and, and mm. doing the engineering bits yeah yeah because you because then you know you like especially with with drums you know you put the overhead somewhere and you get so many phase, options then, yeah yeah and then you move them somewhere else in the room and the whole thing sounds totally different it's like yeah, wow yeah. It's, it's, yeah. it's cool and then every time i go into the studio with someone like scott or or the guy i use in in warsaw um a guy called janos mm. uh then i'll i, I get stuck in yeah with yeah the engineering stuff because i want to i just want to know that stuff and i'm always asking what mike what mics they are and what for yeah. And why um, is this placement better than this placement and all that, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And um, their answer is always, well, we've just done it so many times. We know that that's the best place in the room. So <laughs> yeah. it's, it's a really, I guess they know their answer, rooms, but... don't they as well. So they've yeah, totally, messed around but... with them so much. Yeah. I've always been, I've always been kind of into that. It's kind of fun. Mm. I think, you know, cause you, you, you create the sound when you're playing, but also the placement changes so much and, mm. and the kind of microphones you use and where, mm. and, you know, you can if you get the mics right, the positioning right, and the playing right, it just it you can get really amazing results with not not much. a huge amount of stuff, yeah, yeah, you, yeah um, and not with you don't need mega expensive gear. You just mm. if you really know what you're doing on all three of those levels in yeah. terms of the, the placement, of picking the right microphone, and uh, and playing well, then it can yeah. you can get amazingly professional results with minimal equipment. I think yeah. it's great. Have really you found fun. that you've learned uh, because I know you went to um uh that college or the sixth form BIM. as it were. I went to oh and, oh that college, yeah. yeah then and then obviously Arts. you went to BIM as well, because I was I I had that as one of my notes. I make little notes, you see, to ask to remind myself to ask you're, you about things. You're prepared, of just, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Instead of tra trailing off for four hours, which I I do all the time. But Oh, we will. <laughs> we, will we will anyway. Go on some yeah, tangents. Exactly. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Sorry in advance, everybody that's listening. Um we but, are but we are the two most tangential people, I think. As <laughs> That's well. a great word. Wow. <laughs> I don't know if it's a real one. <laughs> it is now. We're already tangentializing already. I love it. Anyway, yeah. so I'm going to keep on track. So yeah. So yeah. Bib, I was I was curious. I'm, I can't remember if I've asked you this already, but um, did you feel that that was a you know that was a benefit as a metal drummer especially because <clears throat> I don't know I've never been to a music school. Anyone who doesn't know what BIM is, it's a it's a kind of it's a music exclusive school in the UK. Not just the UK; it's kind of everywhere now, isn't it? But it's a, it's everywhere. They've got BIM Berlin. Uh, mm. Anywhere that starts with a B. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that, that used to be the joke, and then they start. I think they've got Hamburg as well. They've got oh. they've got a few around. Um, so they've, they've it's changed. Just, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what's happened with them post Brexit. If they're still mm. carrying on with that, oh, what, God, what's yeah. going on there? That's but um thing. but um yeah did you yeah, find that's... out that did you find that it was uh like was it filled with benefits was it was it worth your time do you feel like I as loved a, it as a performer and a metal drummer you know yeah I loved experience? it every day of it I loved it I thought it was wow. brilliant um because I know a lot of people kind of went there and it's it's I heard it loads of times from people at ACM as well and and um and other colleges and they would just sort of whinge the whole time <laughs> about the you know the curriculum or they're not doing enough playing or they're not doing too much of one thing and not enough of the other or whatever yeah um but also though those were the same people that were skipping lessons all the time yeah you know <laughs> so you can't have it both ways yeah it's like man you've taken you've taken out a loan i've got like 20 grand of debt that's going to remain unpaid forever because <laughs> <laughs> because i chose a career in metal yeah and but like i'm paying for this man so i'm just mm. gonna go there and, and learn and i was really lucky with the teachers i had mm. you know i had some some amazing teachers steve white was teaching there for a year which oh, was cool. phenomenal yeah that that was the thing that really made me pull my finger out mm. i was working hard already but then steve white came in and took over for a year of for the second year of my three-year degree and it it just turbocharged the practice routine and everything you know it wow. really because he just came in on day one and just sat down at the kit and played paradiddles at like 240 bpm <laughs> and everybody just <laughs> sat there like what the fuck is that <laughs> and he just wow. he just went practice and we went okay <laughs> yes sir so what so was he quite old school then with it in a way? oh yeah he's proper yeah, old school like military if you, almost. If you have yeah uh yeah if you have him 
if you ever have him on Instagram or Tinder, uh, not Tinder, sorry, Twitter, <laughs> not Tinder. He might be on Tinder. You never know. <laughs> yeah, if you've got him on Instagram or Twitter or whatever, <laughs> then uh, you can you can see, you know, he'll po- he posts up videos and stuff. He was playing with Paul Weller. Yeah, yeah, uh, style council. Yeah, uh, I think he filled in for the Who at one point. Mm. He's definitely very accomplished. He's done he's, a whole ton he, more that I can't even. Yeah, think yeah. I mean, head, but... <clears throat> I mean, he's a you know he's a proper proper jazz drummer and, mm. and everything. You know, he knows he knows so so much. And actually, yeah. what you see him play normally is just a fraction of it all. Yeah, yeah. Um, just um, making he uh, was, what he needs to do to get paid, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he's 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 kind of a kingmaker as well in terms of like who who he's taught mm. people like Craig Blundell as well and things uh, like that. Yeah. But, so he's um. He's sort of one of those people that um, a lot of uh, a lot of his students go on to get high profile gigs and mm. turn out to be really good. Um, um, and did you learn, like, obviously being a metal drummer in that situation, I mean, I assume at that point you were already like drenched in metal. <laughs> you were like, oh, yeah, totally. Totally. Were, Since you, the age of 10. were you blast beats as well? Were you extreme metal or was it kind of? I was kind of, but I wasn't I wasn't actually any good at them. <laughs> um which is crazy it was thinking all... about it now <laughs> well I'll, I'll tell you one thing um the only reason i got good at blast beats is because i had to for vader ah uh, interesting it's because because i tried practicing it uh, i tried practicing them but i didn't have any reason mm, mm. and until a goal until until i had like a proper gig yeah my first ever paying gig where I was going to have to do that or look like a total dick on stage. <laughs> that was that was the that was the thing that lit a fire under me and actually wow. got me doing them. And I think a, a lot of where people fall down with blast is because they don't actually have to do it. Yeah, on a day to day, a lot of kind of for a for a legitimate reason, kind of. Situation. Yeah. So yeah. like when people ask me, when when younger students especially kind of ask me about blasting and and um, or fast playing and general i'm like first question i ask them back is why do you want to do it mm. do you have to do it for it do you have any songs yeah where that's that where that's 40 is, and upwards yeah <laughs> is, your, is your band playing that and the, you know they might be in some kind of rock band or whatever it's like you're not going to use that better <laughs> yeah. off you know you gotta i think it's it's better if, you, if you've got a goal in mind or there's a there's a band you're actually playing in that's doing that kind of stuff and you can't quite nail it then is the right time yeah yeah to really really drill it yeah because otherwise you're just sitting there practicing single strokes and it's so boring <laughs> it's so boring dude it's so boring <laughs> and it just is the worst that's <laughs> why i could never get on with it because it just killed any fun mm, mm. and it was just so it was it was just so boring and i never wanted to do it so i would practice it for like a week and then stop and yeah practice other stuff that i was actually that i needed to finish my degree or yeah or or that I needed to play I needed for divine chaos songs or yeah. whatever you know and it, and uh I think that's a really important thing to take into account if you actually want to learn this stuff yeah absolutely and do you find but, that your so but I was your... blasting before yes and it was all right hand on the <laughs> snare drum <laughs> oh okay so what uh I can't remember Jeff from Carcass calls that the cheap blast <laughs> I have no idea why <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the I guess because only blast. one hand is uh, is doing the work. Well, it's because you're using <laughs> the dominant hand, and then the, like if and then your hi hat or or um or whatever, you can kind of get away with not playing that tight. Yeah, that's true. Because <laughs> you can, <laughs> it's all splashy and like <laughs> exactly. Yeah, just have open up the hi hats and, and just, <laughs> just cl- clang swish them. away. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Clang them. Just make sure you hit a china on the one. <laughs> yeah, and then exactly. you're good. And as as long as your china and your kick drum kind of come in roughly around the one, then you know no one will know. <laughs> not really. No, not especially not when you're actually playing in small small bands in a pub. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, no one cares. So just put your head down and go for it, people. Um, but, <laughs> so did you take a lot away from, you know, learning from people like Steve White and non. Very, very totally. non-metal drummers. Um, did totally. you take a lot away from that that you've now incorporated into your, especially now, extreme metal playing and metal playing in general? Yeah, all the time. Um, and they they were great because they could see already, mm. like, you know, I was the one kid with metal T-shirts and long hair. <laughs> in class, so it's, it's not... <laughs> 
you like metal, don't you? How did you know? Yeah. <laughs> it was literally <laughs> what I was thinking. It's so obvious. They're geniuses. But they, they could, <laughs> but also, there was quite quite early on in the first year, we got to bring it, you know, we were all asked to bring in a song and I brought in a Divine Chaos song. Oh, cool. That, that I had already been playing live and stuff. Mm. Um, it was quite a slow one. And then everybody asked me to do another one. I was like, well, I got this other one. It's like, it's like 200 BPM kind of sing, singles, um, kicks all the way through. Yeah. And um, I played that and then they realized, oh, that's what he's good at. Like, yeah, yeah. So I, I showed some kind of talent for metal. Mm. And then every time we were doing something, they were like, you want to learn this because when you go and do this in a uh, metal band, you can do it in this way. So Cool. They, so it was very practical as well. So yeah, Pat. Um, there's a drummer called Pat Garvey who's really good, and he's really worth following on Instagram because he does a lot of one-minute lessons that are great. Yeah. Um. And another one, the head of drums, Adam Bushel. He's he's moved on now, but he was head of drums at the time. They would tailor a lot of stuff, or they would they'd sort of take me aside every now and then and explain how to how to put it in metal. Yeah, they, that's cool. Because Pat Pat is a kind of metal guy and adam is more of a metal enthusiast he just loves drummers and drumming so <laughs> he was he, he loves guys like scott travis and dave lombardo and kind of yeah more traditional more yeah traditional but excellent oh yeah of course yeah still absolutely drummers but they were they were really able to to kind of put it all in perspective for me in that way so thanks to them i'm, I'm able to use it all the time yeah yeah absolutely well i'd say like from from watching you uh, not in a creepy way. Sounds a bit creepy, but you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> from see, you know, watching a lot of your videos, I'm not sure I've ever actually seen you play in the flesh live. I'm trying Probably to not. I have. We've only crossed paths a couple of times. Yeah, actually, yeah, we've actually only sp- borrowing your floor, Tom. It's the second time I've ever met. That's true. Well, I mean, and this is why this is a really unique one for me because you are the only person in, as I told you the other day, uh, James is the only person that I've seen in person. In the last, well, what was it? Bit well over a year, oh, over a year now. In in the metal scene, obviously, I've seen other people in person. Yeah, and your children. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Why? I've just been stuck in my strange little drum room just by myself. This time. <laughs> so it's not really a podcast. It's just a cry for help. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Let me have this room, someone. But uh, yeah, so uh, because uh, yeah, obviously, because you came to the um, you came to the UK from from Poland, and um, watching you play like. Your, I don't, I hate using the word technique because it's such an overused word. But yeah, the way, just the way you play, is, I, it's not super common. I would say in in a lot of extreme metal, largely with the amount of wrists you use and the amount of kind of I would say, fluidity. Like just watching you with absolutely no audio, you wouldn't necessarily tell that you you know apart from the long hair and the beard and the the metal shirt. You know, the, the way you position yourself and the, the movements that you make are, I'd say, relatively unique in the extreme metal. There are drummers that do other drummers that, that play that way, but like the way you move is very fluid and it's a lot more, I don't know. Again, that you use a lot more wrist. The whole body's a little bit more involved. It's not just like, you know, head down and rigid blast. Blah, blah, blah. And was that is that a, was that a conscious effort on your part to make <sighs> things more fluid and make things more kind of dynamic and, and, and that kind of thing? I mean, first of all, cheers. That's 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 awesome to hear. Thanks, but <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> you're all right. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> By the way, you're, you're fine. Uh... No, it was it, brown. It wasn't color. really. <laughs> it wasn't really like a a conscious effort necessarily, or. It, or rather it was a conscious effort just over a long long time mm. you know i've been i've been playing live shows we we were we were on the same same scene back in the days and everything. yeah yeah when we were teenagers I mean, you, you were, yeah and you know then you every now and then you'd see like a really good drummer like, i don't know if you ever saw zerath no but i always heard about them and i always heard mike about their Pitt, drummer too. <laughs> mike Pittman, fucking hell he's still so good He's he's really really one of the top drummers I've ever seen in my life. Wow! And he deserves way more credit than he gets. He's so good. Wow! But every now and then that you you know you encounter drummers of that level on the local scene and you think, oh mm. shit, that's cool. 
Yeah. And then you kind of you kind of take it all in and then YouTube came along and there was guys like Flo and George yeah, and Derek. They were game changers for oh, guys like us. Flo Mornier, <laughs> George Carlius and Derek Roddy. Mm. The guy, you know, the guys to really do this mega well and also document it. Yeah, yeah. For the first time. Because this, yeah, this, this was totally undocumented. Mm. And then there was um and, and Daniel. Daniel's got a really cool flow, Daniel Alanson. Yeah, I love his but super tasty, um, super creative. Uh, and also Adrian. Adrian's yeah. great because he's mm. he's like the he's the opposite of Daniel in so many ways. Where like, in so Daniel's many ways all the well. kind of <laughs> yeah, it's it's great watching two two of them because Adrian's just a sledgehammer battering know, through dude. the stuff. I love and it's it. so and it's so cool. And and Daniel's kind of quite refined and mm. Mm. and um and he's got got all these kind of in- intricacies, but yeah, absolutely. Adrian, absolutely. Adrian will smash smash through it, and you can see everyone is banging their heads. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's all there. So they, and it was trying to kind of combine all all of those things. Mm. I think because bottom line is, I love metal. I really do. Yeah. So still to this day, do you still kind of listen to metal relatively often? Yeah, I listen. All, all I listen time, quite even. a lot. <laughs> still, yeah. Um, yeah. That's rad. Not not only not only I don't listen to metal much on tour, mm. which but makes I do, sense because you're surrounded by it. Because it's because <laughs> it's just I, for me it's the cardinal sin on the tour bus. Yeah, you know, is is listening to metal once the show's over. If, you oh, know, and you get off stage and everyone just wants yeah, to pound if, fucking or day you, aside if, or something. <laughs> it's or, like, oh, or, God. <laughs> or origin. Yeah, <laughs> like that's there's a time happens. and a place for that stuff, isn't there? <laughs> yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong; it's amazing, and John Long's, Longstreth is is something else, but absolutely not, not, not then. <laughs> not at two a.m. when you've just played an hour and yeah, a half of, of especially. Blast beats. It's always on the shows as well, where you've got like no drum take. You're packing the shit yourself, <laughs> yeah, exactly. and it's just like it's just some kind of sensory overload. And it's the worst. <laughs> but basically. The, the sort of the fluidity in inverted commas just comes from all of those things and throw and throw I throw my whole I try and throw my whole body into it because I think mm. that's what metal drummers should do when you watch yeah. guys like Dave Lombardo you know he gives it everything absolutely it doesn't yeah. matter he's not concerned about how tight it is or if he's exactly on the money yeah. that's what yeah, makes him so great yeah exactly because it's not about that mm. you know and so trying to trying to capture that kind of spirit but also with a kind of with the background that I've had mm. with actually being properly educated. Mm. Um, yeah. And the live experience on top, kind of mixing all of those things up. Yeah. Is, is, I guess is what's led to that. Yeah. So it's kind of a, it was a unconscious, but um, natural progression in. Yeah. In I mean, it was, it was kind of conscious because you see a show back and you think, Oh, I'm looking down too much or I'm yeah, doing true. this. You, you see yourself back because in the age of YouTube, how can you not? Mm. Um, Unfortunately. <laughs> for us all. <laughs> but, you know, that's... But, you know, then you, you film yourself and you see yourself and you think, oh, that was lame. I'm not going to do that again. <laughs> yeah, or, true. It's or, a learning or, process, isn't it? Yeah, that's true. And every every now and then you'll see something, especially in the old, older shows, like first Vader shows or whatever. I'll, mm. I'll watch, occasionally something will pop up on the on the feed and I think, Oh, here we go. But then there's like, there's some bits where I'm like, okay, yeah, that was, that was pretty good. Yeah. I still yeah. do that now. I still yeah. do that bit, but I don't do any, <laughs> any of the other shit around I've, it. I've refined the other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And I play in time now. <laughs> yeah. That makes total sense. And also, you know, joining a band like Vader, especially there's, there's gotta be, and uh, well, I mean, and a lot of the stuff that you play anyway, outside Vader, decapitated included, but there's there needs to be some kind of economy, doesn't there? Like mo- emotion economy and figuring out the best way to do that. I'm sure. Well, is, yeah, you got to you got to survive a show. It? Exactly, you got to survive exactly. a show. Like um, my first Vader shows, I would spunk it all on the first two songs, <laughs> and then just like limp through the rest of the set, like the rest of the hour. <laughs> Just that initial like fuck yeah I'm on stage and then oh god what am I yeah doing? yeah you get the initial <laughs> you get the initial burst of the adrenaline I always have a coffee before the gig and and 
you know, it's it's natural. You know, you want to hit it hard and go in for that for that energy, but mm. and you learn quite quickly not to overdo it. Yeah, and that and all especially, plays into part of your technique and and, and how you play and all that it stuff. It does because instead of thinking about it on a song by song basis, now I think about it more as a, especially in the live shows. I'm thinking about the set. Mm. Like, okay, this is a bit of an easier track. So I better lay lay off so that I can be ready to hit on the next one, that's, yeah. which is a blasting tune, you know, or whatever. Absolutely, yeah. And so before I was thinking, oh, this is gonna, this is a hard bit, and then this is an, you know, in a just a so the song was a self-contained, yeah, unit, yeah. yeah. And I was just trying to get through the song, yeah. And it wasn't until I started thinking about the set much more as a whole mm. that I was able to pace myself better because it's like trying to sprint a marathon. That's kind of what I think about these. Death yeah, that makes shows. total sense. It makes total sense. Yeah, and uh, you know, I, I don't know about you, but like f- for me, at different points in the set, I'm aware of which point in the set it is. If you know what I mean. So like, if I'm already feeling tired and I'm on the fourth song, I'll be like, oh, okay, right, I need to really pace myself for the next couple of. You got to economize. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Or if you know, I'm feeling great on the seventh song, I'll be like, oh, cool, I can push it a bit more for the next couple because I'm still feeling yeah. right. Yeah, and there's there's a lot of weird psychological effects as well on top like i always play it doesn't matter how dead i am the last two songs were always killer yeah yeah, yeah. you, know, the, you find the energy it. from yeah, you, <laughs> yeah you're like all right oh the, so, it's, the show's over now i just fucking don't yeah. care it doesn't you know, matter if i fuck it up yeah exactly <laughs> like i'm just i'm just dreaming about the cold beer in the backstage <laughs> afterwards or whatever i'm and, not I've, I've already checked out it's like the yeah. last week before the summer holidays <laughs> <laughs> yes. it's no the one's same paying attention type of thing. Yeah. <laughs> oh everybody's hammered by this point doesn't yeah. matter yeah exactly i can That's, smell the beer <laughs> but it's it's also kind of easier to focus as well mm. so it's not like i just like check out or something like i'm actually able to keep the focus but with less effort yeah at that point more like a flow state type thing almost yeah because you kind of know that the hard bit's over Mm, mm. Oh, the or, thinking or, about or, what the next song is thinking about the count-ins thinking about the or the transition yeah, between this and this yeah, and... especially because the drummers are in charge of everything now oh dude fucking so annoying isn't it? <laughs> I, I i miss i miss the early gigs man when it was just i miss the early gigs before triggers when you could just turn up right there's oh, no yeah. in-ears yeah there was some wedge that didn't work properly <laughs> just sounded right, like you're all sharing <laughs> one <laughs> all sharing one drum kit you just put your pedals up you put your cymbals on you put your snare up and you just go and hope it for the all best. sounds yeah and no no, no one can on hear anybody yeah exactly. <laughs> and and you know you just you just play half an hour of absolute mayhem <laughs> and then <laughs> and don't think mayhem. about it anymore yeah yeah and then and just get was, drunk <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, like yeah. those shows, those early gigs, you'll remember. Yeah, if yeah. you watch them back on YouTube or whatever, you'll hear a four count and then just nothing. Like, <laughs> 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 yeah, exactly. You can't really make out each section and like you don't know what the guitars are playing. <laughs> yeah, but, but now it's like, man, you're in charge of like running all the clicks and the backing tracks. It's always the drummer mm-hmm. as well. It's, it's Absolutely. Except, yeah. for, except for Niall. I think Carl Sanders is still running all the backing tracks for Niall, which is mad. Wow. Is that, he's got that crazy thing in front of him. He's right? got like, a pedal. Yeah. He's got like, it's, it's like a MIDI pedal linked up to a computer wow, screen. That's and what that is. That thing's I don't, huge. I don't, I've always wondered what that was. <laughs> I don't know if they're still doing it. If they are, it's mad. It's crazy. That's but that's the only band I've ever seen where... Jo- where George, one of the best drummers in the world as well, is yeah. not in charge of any of the backing tracks. That's, That's it. Insane. That's it. I always uh, there's a hilarious story of George. We played uh, we played just after Niall at oh I can't remember what it was Hellfest. Is this Carcass? Or one of, yeah, sorry, Carcass played just after Niall at I can't remember where it was. Yeah, Hellfest. I think it was Hellfest. But he was uh, he was setting up his kit, you know, like his fucking monster. Yeah, the kit. monster. Yeah, and he didn't have a. Um, he didn't have a drum tech, so he'd, he'd literally got there like as soon as the bus arrived. He'd got gone straight over. It was at like one in the afternoon. They weren't playing till like nine or something. Yeah. He'd spent pretty much the whole day sorting everything out, making sure he had everything and setting it all up. And, uh, and I arrived at the time I was just playing a four piece. There was a, there was a period where I played just a four piece with Carcass, like one rack, one floor. And, and one um, kick. Uh, one kick, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Dude, just, I'm just lazy, man. Uh, our sound guy asked me to add more toms because he said there's just no like stereo. It's just not. It's yeah. just a bit boring. And I was like, all right, fair enough. So now I've added some more toms back in, and it's it's a lot more enjoyable. But 
uh, I was it was more like a challenge to see if I could do it, you know, and I kind of did. It wasn't ideal, but um, anyway, sorry, I'm tangenting again. But uh, yeah, so George was on the riser in front of me and he just turned around and I it literally took me like 40 minutes to set up my little four piece like punk kit. Yeah, and he just yeah. came over to me and he was like, what the fuck, man? I'm doing this all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and he just like yeah. he just hung his head and like just had a cigarette and I was like yeah sorry bro <laughs> it is but it he is, is one of the best exhausting. in the world so <laughs> he, he is he's, he's he's so good as well like I was kind of when when I first saw him we did we did um, a few shows Vader and Nile together mm. and I was kind of prepared to it for him to be good but not as good as i <laughs> probably thought from youtube you know what i mean when yeah yeah because there's always I've, I've seen it with a lot of drummers as well because um, especially in the age of kind of quite high quality drum videos and stuff there's yeah. a lot of there's a lot of ways to do it so that Trickery. it looks effortless <laughs> yeah there's a lot of that stuff whereas it's possible to do that and so i was like i it's, i was kind of fully cynical and prepared for him to not be quite as good as I was mm. expecting him. He was so much better. <laughs> and I was it was it was great. I learned so much from him as well. He was really friendly, really helpful. Oh, he's really a lovely super, guy, isn't he? Yeah, I've met him. Super a sweet times. guy. He's really lovely. He even invited me down to he used to invite me down to clinics when wow, when he was, was doing them and stuff as well. He was really cool. Yeah. And he taught me a lot about setting my pedals. The reason why I set my pedals so heavy is because I wanted to out George him. I was gonna say because I mean, <laughs> he's notoriously got fucking crazy pedal settings, right? But yeah, you've I got can... the craziest pedal settings I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah, they're even worse than his. I was gonna say, and you, I mean, you're are you are you still on the Dynasynx now? I yeah. am, and yeah. the pedals are much lighter. I'm still kind of figuring it out. Yeah, um, that translating your original pedal settings from yeah, because to... I did I did the the settings that I always had for the Iron Cobras. And it just doesn't work. Yeah. Completely it just different doesn't. beast. Yeah. Um, so, and I tried going back to the Cobras and it was, that was tough. So now I'm stuck <laughs> in pedal limbo. Not quite right with the Dynasynx, but the Cobras are too, too extreme. They're, they're, I'm like, this is what, this is what other drummers feel like when they play on <laughs> those pedals. But yeah. Like, again, I've never played your pedals, but I've seen how your pedals are and they're cranked springs, right? Beaters all the way back pretty much. It's the cranked heavy springs as well. Oh God! <laughs> so it's just man. like it was just unacceptable. Yeah, but <laughs> was it almost a joke thing is, to I, yourself? <laughs> See how extreme it kind it kind <laughs> at the end. Yeah, it, before I switched to the Dynasynx, I was just like, yeah, how let's see how I much this. <laughs> yeah, just get drummers from the support bands up or whatever. Oh, you have a go. It's always good fun. <laughs> Do your worst. <laughs> really? Yeah. Um, but it did. The thing is, it I kind of switched my pedals slowly over that time after first meeting george and getting heavier and heavier and getting used to that yeah um, and that was because of him initially that 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 yeah totally began. and he he's he said that he, he before access he was just on iron Cobras all the time and you know yeah. dave dave lombardo my, my my hero for sort of power playing stuff he's mm. always on iron cobras yeah um so i just figured okay well if they're good enough for people if they're good enough for <laughs> yeah, those kind lombardo of people and, then, yeah then why am i going to rush out and buy by a direct drive pedal the only reason i'm using direct drive at the moment is because they're made by tama yeah exactly you know this is the only thing that would convince me to to switch mm. Mm. and i mean i really like them but we'll see we'll see how it is in about a year because i think yeah. i guess we've got like a little bit of time now still before shows come back so i'm just gonna try and get used to them and and an ab and try and get used to my iron cobras again as well just yeah just in case be... yeah because <laughs> yeah, i'm because i'm curious now I'm I'm curious and I've got a bit of because I had to kind of just stick with one while I was going through all these recordings and things and mm. I didn't want to be sw constantly switching pedals and yeah, stuff like that so I've given them a given them a proper go now and now I've got a bit of time with with less work to just kind of practice with them and see um, see how I really feel about them mm, instead of just because that's the thing isn't it about um, and I've spoken about this before with um pre lockdown we do well, you especially because you're busier than most people i knew before lockdown anyway but um you just you kind of have to always be gig ready and so there's not a huge amount of time to like 
as you say, try out new pedals. And if you're trying out new pedals, you've only got a, a week or so, and then you either have to try them on yeah. the show or you have to just, you know, leave them at home and go with what you know. And it's so it's having this time, as I assume, for yourself, has it been kind of cool? Or actually, you're only just about to get that time, I guess. I'm, I'm actually, yeah, I'm only, I'm only getting it now. Yeah. Wow. Right at the end. Uh, That's amazing. <laughs> I'm really curious about speaking of Vader. We've obviously spoken about Vader a lot. What was the how? How did that actually happen? How did you actually get into Vader? Because I remember, uh, I remember hearing about you before, maybe before the news was released. But I remember being at a festival. It was with the board, I'm pretty sure. And um, uh, one of the members came back, and they were like that fucking Vader drummer is sick. And in my head, I was like, yeah, yeah, Dare. And then uh, and then they started talking about it because Dare was just before you, right, I believe? No, right? no, there was Dare, then Pavulon. Ah, so, okay, maybe, maybe I, well, I was thinking it was Dare, so I was too behind. But <laughs> And then um, and then the, the guys were talking about, oh, no, it's that guy from the UK. And I was like, huh? They've got, they've got a guy from the UK? Yeah. And then, yeah, and it's then James. Who? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then obviously, <laughs> then you were kind of, everywhere and i was like oh shit this guy is incredible so like what was the what was the pre-vader then how did you get vader and then yeah and then we'll move on from there (laughs) well pre-vader my first proper metal band um was divine chaos Mm. who have been on the scene since forever on the on the sort of local scene they were were there since forever they were there before long time before i joined even Mm. um and they had they had some success with the first EP, um, Every Empire Shall Fall, back in the days, because they won a battle of the bands and used oh, wow. the money to go <laughs> back when a battle of the bands would win you money as well. <laughs> That's unimaginable now. <laughs> yeah, and they, they spent they spent all that money on, on going to Scott Atkins. Oh cool, wow. So this is where this Full is where circle. the Scott connection Yeah, this is <laughs> totally where it all comes comes in and we we did a pub gig. I was I was playing in the band. I don't know if you know Nimai, actually. Nimai, who's Aeon Promotions. I know his name. I don't know. Bailway way in Winchester, probably. Oh, okay, there we go. That's probably why. <laughs> but he's he's a good lad. We were in a band together back hmm. at back in those times. And um I got asked if I if I would audition for Divine Chaos. Hmm. Off, off the back of a show that we did together, but I did. I was so young and naive and stupid. I didn't really understand that it was an audition, so I just <laughs> thought I had the gigs. So I learned all the songs, like because you know I've got the gigs, so I have to do them. Yeah, yeah. And actually, that's what got me the gig <laughs> because you learned all the songs. Because because I didn't realise it was an audition, so I learned them like I had to play them live or whatever. <laughs> so I just turned up and smashed. <laughs> so your ignorance actually paid off. <laughs> totally, totally. I wasn't clever enough to be worried about it. <laughs> so like about that's amazing about about halfway through they were like oh this is pretty good but we've got some other drummers to audition and i was like this is a, a what <laughs> this, or, seriously. Or, audition what are you talking about <laughs> wow that's amazing so and this is before i even went to bim or anything or really knew anything about an audition process yeah. or what because i was or, just like the only drummer around yeah <laughs> normally but amongst my my group of friends or whatever so i didn't I knew a few others, mm. of course, but it wasn't not particularly well. And I, the the whole concept of competition for gigs was was still kind of a new yeah yeah of course because there was yeah. um because there were plenty of like established bands already like Silosis Cy- and Biatrophy, mm. but they already had guys like Rob Callard and and yeah. Reynolds, yeah. you know. So it wasn't that was that was a whole different league. We're talking sort of sub. Yeah, <laughs> yeah sub that that league so it wasn't i was i was under that radar totally there was no way i would get an audition for a proper band like them mm. really so and i did it didn't occur to me that other bands might want to try out other drums at all <laughs> and that's the the to- that's that's what got me I the fucking that. gig completely fucking that i was way too stupid to worry <laughs> about it and so i just turned up i turned up and nailed it because i wasn't even i just figured that i was going to have to play this shit wow that's brilliant, man. It's really, <laughs> I love that. It's really funny. Um, so that's good audition advice. Just pretend you've got just, the gig already. Just act like you've got the gig, and, and then hopefully you should uh, get the gig. Not not in a not in an arrogant way. Just in no, a sort of no. a, innocent in a way. kind of 
Yeah, because they were also all, they are also all much older than me. So I was 18, they were like 24 to 26. Ah, okay, okay. Um, so again, there was, um, there was that, there was that kind of dynamic as well, where I was really just, I was just some kid, literally yeah, just yeah. some kid yeah. turning up. <laughs> they um, know all the songs somehow. But anyway, <laughs> well, I mean, they, they sent them all to me. It wasn't just like I started like hunting down on the tracks. They sent, they sent me everything. <laughs> But I don't think they expected me to like really go into as much detail or anything That's as amazing, I did man. because it was commitment um, already. <laughs> oh yeah, because I thought, well, I'm in the band, so I better learn the shit. <laughs> and I wasn't. <laughs> I wasn't even in the band. It's nuts. Oh, I love that. But yeah, I had no idea I was meant to be auditioning. That's fucking yeah. That is the best uh, great. audition advice I think I've ever heard. <laughs> And anyway, off the back of that, we did we did a bunch of gigs, and I did my they um, Chris O'Toole, the guitarist. He's been through ACM, mm. so that was also really helpful. He was already a graduate of ACM, and I was about to go to BIM, so I got a lot of advice from him. And we were jamming all the time, mm. you know, before before shows and stuff. So he would come down to Brighton, and we would jam a lot, and and so I was getting all this extracurricular stuff and that was really good and then in 2009 we ended up doing another battle of the bands which which we won (laughs) which was the battle for bloodstock oh cool okay and after that we came to the attention of a manager and i've been i did a little preparation for this as well because i had to try and remember his name (laughs) so scott scottish guy called graham boyle who Ended up like ripping loads of people off, and it was really bad. Oh, nice! There's a few but, of them, isn't there? There's a few of them around. Yeah, but but what he did, <laughs> the one the one thing that he did do was the one really good thing that he did was for us, which was get us on the Vader tour as support. Ah, oh, okay. And he got us he got us on the tour bus and everything. So it was Divine Chaos, oh, wow. as, band, as you drown, and then Vader. And so that's sort of how I became introduced. Yeah, cool. Into that, and because because DC had been jamming all the time and. I was at college. Chris had been through college, and we were a we were a pretty tight unit by that point because we'd gone mm. gone a couple of years of just doing the local scene, playing the like the railway in and the was it the George? Is it the George? Oh, the George in Andover. In Andover. Yeah, yeah, dude. Anyone who's and not Ash, from the UK. Ash Pearson's play there as well with Three Inches of Blood. Really? Oh, dude. Funny enough. That, sorry, tangent. I've I've had uh, a, both Adrian and Ash have spoken about you on the previous podcast because. Uh, they got lessons from you, I believe, right? Adrian hasn't yet. Oh, but he wants to. He wants to because he wants to soak up some of your uh, some of your stuff. <laughs> He's telling me so. Anyway, sorry, that's a tangent. Yeah. But yeah, so you've been you've been spe- you're the most spoken about drummer on this podcast. So far. Oh, <laughs> but, even um... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I well, love Adrian go. and Ash. Anyway, I, sorry, I dude. Well. I've totally great. interrupted you. Totally interrupted your story. But yeah, so we did we do all those those kind of shows on the on the local circuit and we had we had a fair bit of experience doing all that kind of stuff and vader had actually just changed lineups like almost okay. all of them were gone so we were in we were in a stronger position as a lineup than, than vader were by far mm. and it kind of, it was it was sort of showing a little bit mm. and you know we were only playing half an hour though and, and on weight on first and they were a more professional unit because they hadn't been together that long, but they were much more professional musicians. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's not like it's not like we were we were slaying them or anything. We weren't, but we we had we had that connection that they didn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, I so the crew, I bonded with the crew, and and with the with the guys so much so that um, the crew took me over to Poland. Um, after that tour to do uh, a session to do a fill-in tour for for their their band some members of that crew had a, had a band oh wow cool and we're doing a tour afterwards wow. so they brought me over i went home so i was meant to go away for a month i went away for a month came back for a week and then went straight back out on tour that's so what i mean about these began. things yeah <laughs> that's what i mean about all this stuff snowballing that's why i've got the serious fomo now yeah absolutely but it's a, it's a it, big part of what we do isn't it it's it comes from opening it comes doors. from those really unexpected places yeah and then mm. So I did that tour, which was a tour of Poland around. And I, I met loads of people and my name kind of got out there. And this was almost exactly the same time that, uh, that Krim started playing shows with DCAP. With DCAP, yeah. And he was the first guy 
first non-Polish guy to really break the Polish scene's really secular. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so Krim basically did me a massive favor by breaking <laughs> in there first. Oh, it's so possible set, to have a non-Polish drummer. Yeah. <laughs> he set a precedent. Yeah. Because no band before them would have thought Vader would never have taken me if Decap hadn't taken Krim first. Wow. Amazing. For sure. That's amazing. Because that's that's how it worked, you know. Yeah. Like the they would have <laughs> Basically, yeah, and then the scene became much more, much more open mm. after that. And now there's now there's a bit more variety. There's a few people around on the Polish scene that that aren't from aren't from, from Poland, Poland, but but yeah. back then, but there was no way in that first instance. So if I would never have done even that session tour, yeah, if not, they were there's no way. Wow. It's crazy. That is crazy. crazy. But come to think so, of it, yeah, and I think that's probably why I was so shocked when whoever it was in the band said, "Oh, it's that the, that kid from the UK." I was like, "Huh, UK?" I think yeah. it was, it's that knowledge that, like, oh, Polish bands are they just keep in with Polish? They, they people. really, really <laughs> do. Like, it's all, you know, it's all Polish crew, yeah, all Polish members, like almost all the time. But now it's 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 a bit different. But yeah, it's opening up. Yeah, that's cool. So I kind of owe owe Krim a bit for that as well because yeah. it just. It, they wouldn't have really thought to do it. That's cool. And then, and then off the back of that, that that tour went quite well, and I had showed some kind of aptitude. And then, not long afterwards, Pavolon decided to quit and called me up and asked me if I'd be interested. And I said, of, of course I would. And they offered me the gig, and then I got it. And that was when I really had to knuckle down and get on the blasting. Yeah. So actually, I had until to until that point. We you weren't kind of as you said before you weren't like especially vader level blasting dude that must have been a fucking yeah i i literally went from camp. 260 <laughs> jesus it was it was so hard yeah the audition was the worst because it was i think he gave me i can't remember i had like a month or something yeah. to send six videos and obviously i was weighing it up in my mind for about a day like, how am I going to do this? Am I going to jump in like now, early, be the first, be the first in line? Mm. All right, it's risky though because you have less time to practice. Yeah, of course. But in the end, I decided, yeah, fuck it, let's go for it, and like just did everything. And in six days, I had the video sent. Jesus. So it was. I just decided, you know, like proper crash course. Just shut up and go for it. Just don't think, don't hesitate. Don't overthink yourself. Just, just play. Just, just jump in, yeah. And um, it obviously worked. <laughs> basically, yeah. And it, it, the the bottom line was that doing it quickly worked out way more to my advantage because I showed that I really wanted the gig. Mm. And, yeah, um, that's true. And you know, it also showed that I had to learn the songs quickly. I kind of cheated by knowing them all already. <laughs> <laughs> but, that helps. <laughs> <laughs> um but you know it's you know i i was showing that in six days i can go from go cold into to mm. to something workable mm. it wasn't it wasn't perfect and i also made sure i put some of my own fills in yeah I didn't just copy the stuff and put my own spin on it so the slower bits i really stood out the mm. blasting yeah it's not that great <laughs> but but on a lot of the slower moments i was actually showing some personality and some mm some feel and i think that was what swung it mm. and so again that, that's another advice if you're going for auditions i think is just you know what don't don't think about it too much just getting quick and mm. play to your strengths yeah absolutely is there was there a point as well because obviously you know you got kind of asked was there any point of was there any part of you that thought i i, I don't know if i can do it or did you not even let yourself get oh, to yeah. that point oh no oh no i did i properly because when I first got the when I got the call for the audition, even this time I knew it was an audition. <laughs> when I got the call for the audition, um, I was I, first thing I was I was in shock, and then the whole next day was like I have no idea how the fuck I'm going to do this. Yeah, <laughs> I got the list of songs through, and there's some some blasting at two sixty. There was some double oh, kick at two hundred and thirty. Giving me anxiety just thinking just, about it. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just like i i can't do this i actually wow. can't so do you it. actually had a full moment where you were like no oh, i had I a pa i had a proper panic yeah wow but amazing 
then I just had to, I was like, well, I really want this gig, so I'm going to have to just go and do it, aren't I? Yeah, yeah, and and that's the that's the kind of that's the mental game, right? Is the kind of telling yourself it totally is, yeah, that even though you can't do it, you you almost have to do it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You know what I mean, like, you have to figure exactly. out a fucking way and just do it. <laughs> Actually, there was one really good teacher at BIM who was teaching. He was teaching guitar, but he was also teaching. Um, uh, pedagogy he was teaching how to teach kids oh yeah yeah, yeah. To teach music to kids and he, he'd been on tour a bunch and done loads of sessions and stuff and he went well you should always ask yourself am i gonna die <laughs> no so you know so what have i got to lose yeah yeah so yeah. it's actually and that was pretty good so i was mm. uh, that was kind of what helped brought me back bring me back down mm. to a sort of calm place where i could just and, and then i distracted myself by actually planning because I didn't have any recording stuff really. So I had to just plan, find a place to go and do it. Chris O'Toole from Divine Chaos actually helped um, edit the videos and mix the mix the sound for me. So we set oh, up cool. some mics and the interface and stuff. Yeah. Um, and and that was that really. Yeah, so wow. The that was that. history as it were. <laughs> got the gig, yeah. And then I walked out, I finished my degree. And then two months later, I was on stage in a stadium or not stadium, but um, a really big venue in Poland doing my first gig with Vader. Wow. And that was um, Vader, Exodus, Morbid Angel, Judas Priest. Oh, that's fucking sick, dude. <laughs> was... dude. And this is like, again, like we were talking about, I was talking about this with Dirk again last week. I mean, obviously Dirk's playing for fucking Megadeth yeah, now, yeah. which is insane. They did the, but... the Priest tour, didn't they? Yeah. Um, but it's like, you know, without sounding super cheesy, just go for it because you never know where you're gonna. You never know where you're gonna end up. Like, look at you know, look at me and you. <laughs> you know I mean, we're prime examples. Of like, yeah, just <laughs> put your head down, say yes to things, and do your fucking best. And like, <laughs> yeah, and just and just see where it all takes you. Man, that's mm. the that's the thrill, isn't it? Yeah. So decap, obviously, uh, and that came that came a hundred percent from Vader. That was a that was a Vader transition, was it? Yeah, I mean, totally. Because I mean, I was, I was in Krakow already, which is which is Decap's home base. Mm. Uh, Vader and Decap have talked together hundreds of times. Yeah, they must be friends as well. I assume from the Varg, from... Varg and Pete go back, or like all the way back to the beginning. Yeah, really. I can I mean, imagine. Varg, is, yeah. Varg, if you watch Vog's podcast with Rob Flynn. All he does for ages is just talk about how how good Vader are. He's, <laughs> That's he's, sick. he's still, and whenever I go to Vogue's house, still they're listening to Vader all the time. Like really, it's not That's like so sick. they're not. Me and Vogue are talking about how good Vader are quite a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. especially because we share we share a love of especially some certain old Vader albums. Yeah, like the South EP and stuff. Yeah, of course. And it's not, it's not like um, it's not fake. He's really into it. Like it's always on. It's always so on the stereo, cool. like Black to the Blind and some of the older albums and stuff. That's He's really so into sick. it. He played Invader for a little while after the accident with Vitek and oh, wow. Adrian. Okay. Uh, so there was a lineup for a little while where Vogue, well, Vogue was working in the music store, actually. Yeah. I, ho- I hope he doesn't mind me talking about this. But he was, he was working in the music store and... Um, uh, like the, it was just after sort of Darry Miles and Nove, the the original, or not original, but sort of the Vader in their heyday. Yeah, if you want, mm. they all quit the band around the same time when uh, Darry went to do Borgia. Yeah, and so the next incarnation of Vader had Vogue in it. Yeah, because Vogue was not doing much after the accident or whatever, mm. and that's sort of what helped get Decap back on their feet. I mean, the decap were always going to come back. It just, yeah, sort of, it just helped. It just, yeah. it was just another catalyst. It was another reason to sort of get back in, yeah, playing shows and doing stuff. Mm. So it really does go back a long, long, long way, and it's a real serious friendship. Yeah, that's amazing. If you want, because it's that's amazing. Well, it I must mean, be nice as well, bit for you being kind of seeing that and being on both sides of it as well. <laughs> Well, me, me and Vogue both treat Pete like a dad. Yeah, <laughs> like, like really, you know, it's, it's. I was a huge Vader fan before I joined. Mm. 
uh, and I and I still am now. Yeah, of course. Um, so yeah, it was um, it was totally one hundred percent through Vader that that the decap thing came out because we we toured together, mm. and I I was kind of a safe bet because I was around. Yeah, I was already. I I kind of had the blasting stuff down and everything. It was, I was I was a known player part, in my own right, part of the group as well. You know, the kind of yeah, and the it's clan. the extended, it's the extended family. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. And I was Polish approved. Yeah, <laughs> which is which is not easy. Because <laughs> I I mean, I've been going to Poland for more than ten years, mm. and now I speak uh, a fair bit of the language and everything. Because I guess you're the only non-Polish guy, right, in both of those bands. Pretty much, yeah. Um, there's been instances of other people around, and you, yeah, you get onto the tour bus, and it's it's kind of weird, you know, because everybody else has their own really private language, yeah. especially earlier on. Everyone has their own private language, and every now and then you hear blah 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 blah, blah James, blah blah blah. blah. <laughs> right. like, yeah. I know you're fucking talking about. Yeah. Me. Because there's no way you can hide my name. <laughs> Sounds the same in every language. <laughs> but it's it's weird, you know, because English is so not private. Yeah, exactly. Because everybody speaks it. It's and re- the way everyone speaks it is never private. <laughs> it's just not a private language yeah. at all. And so it's a blessing and a curse because it means you can go pretty much anywhere mm. and be know understood. that you're kind of yeah. going to be all right. You probably had this with aborted though, where you were the, the only English person. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and and Hemshell Burn as well, and uh, with Hemshell, oh yeah, of course, Hemshell Burn more so because they're all German, whereas with aborted we had a, uh, a mix. Yeah, it was French and and Belgian, whereas yeah, uh, uh, yeah, Hemshell Burn is full full Deutsch, full, full Deutsch <laughs> <laughs> or ultimate Deutsch, uber Deutsch, and uh, yeah, so that is the same. You know, it's just German and then Dan. <laughs> Yeah. and you're like oh come on <laughs> and then they laugh and you're like the fuck are you laughing at <laughs> yeah you're like <laughs> yeah but i would i would argue that even german is better than polish for that if you're oh, not dude. used to it german is is i'm not gonna say it's easy it's not easy but it's it's kind of because it's part of the same kind of language group it's a lot easier to figure out the gist of what's going on relatively quickly i think than polish i would have absolutely no idea where to start with polish. Polish. <laughs> i don't i don't know if you ask krim about his time in decap but those those days those guys were not speaking english so well either oh what back in the when crim was when well crim that was, was in... that was about 10 years ago yeah so of course it was around the same time i joined vader so we were both going through the same kind of thing that's why we bonded <laughs> yeah. we were like fuck these guys well he because he was telling me as well that his uh his experience with decap was like a like a boot camp like it was kind of very hard working uh, kind it of is yeah consistent... and the same with vader I was going to say, is there is there a specific difference in the kind of uh, the way Vader works and the way Decap works, or are they relatively similar? It's relatively similar band wise. We just everybody wants to do their best. You want to play a good show. Mm. You kind of want to do as many shows as you can, but at the highest mm. level mm. you can, and you've got to try and find that balance. Yeah, don't burn out. <laughs> um. But it's the, I mean, Vader, Vader is really, is the, the, the school. I mean, that's, that's what Vogue aspired to back in those days as well. Mm. Is that, that style of touring we, in Poland, it's called the, like the commando school because <laughs> you can just turn up in any place and just make a show out of it. Mm. Mm. You can travel for 12 hours in the back of a van, show up at some, some terrible venue backlines all held together with tape and you can still make a shot of it i love that and you go on to the next place yeah so it's kind of a it's kind of like a, that diy kind of punk ethos but it is it totally kind of melded is, into yeah. the extreme metal world i want to ask you one more thing before i do yeah sure. i do this funny little quiz thing i don't know if you know about this quiz no yeah. i don't okay cool right i'll ask you i'm just curious what does your practice look like these days like are you are you still pushing for 300 BP, bpm or are you, or are you are you generally just uh do you practice for things you have coming up do you work on certain things that you want to improve on like what's what's practice look like for you my actual my solo practice practice yeah. is for anything else okay cuz 
um, otherwise, I would fucking hate the instrument by now, <laughs> basically. <laughs> so I think it's really because I do that in rehearsal. I I do rehearse the Vader material, the cap material, whatever's coming up. Mm. I do do it. And I do work a little bit on maintaining the speed so that I'm not killing myself to three days before the gig. I'm not trying to cram yeah. all of that stuff in. But practice time is kind of, it's your time to do something else, find a mm. new thing, find the inspiration or, or figure something out that's going to, going to help you put put something else into it because it's mm. if you're sitting there just focusing on speed and technique that's in my opinion that's not really yeah music anymore that's just programming yeah and there's there's a time and a place for that and it needs to be done maintenance and stuff and you do yeah, need, absolutely um and also you know with i've had it before with with decaf and other sessions where actually it needs a bit of a ramp in tempo Mm. You need to work towards that, but you can do that for twenty. You can do that in twenty minutes a day. Just do yeah. it every day. Yeah. Don't don't do it for two hours every day. Yeah. Because you're only getting you're only getting the twenty minutes worth out of it, and then yeah. the rest is overkill. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, but the the rest of the time, I I'm trying to catch up with with anything else. You know, like maybe. I don't know if you know that drummer Jost Nickel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jam yeah. dude, yeah. He's yeah, he's got his Monday grooves. They're really cool. Is that like a is that like a lesson thing where he teaches you? It's just it's just a little yeah, it's like a thirty second or one minute video, just him playing the groove at a couple of tempos. He's got the notation up. Save the video on Instagram. Give it oh, a cool. go. Oh, cool. The, and just try and try and find stuff that I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. or maybe. Um, and just that, that kind of stuff. Anything mm. else? Anything else? Anything else? Anything else? Because <laughs> because otherwise, there's literally no point. Yeah, yeah. To it, because you just sound you sound like everyone else. Mm. Mm. And you know, we we both teach for the uh, for the DTA, the Drum Technique Academy. Yeah, absolutely. And the biggest strength and the biggest weakness about that drum technique academy is that there's so many drummers all of us and we're really quite similar yeah, yeah we yeah. all have we have a very similar skill set yeah and what 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 if if we don't kind of stagger our lessons and try and find those things that that um separate us <laughs> separate us yeah if we don't yeah. find our own voices within then that. all the students will end up playing the same exercises absolutely. the same absolutely Learning same, the same thing. things so, yeah absolutely so that that is sort of my case in point for mm. why why you should do that you should just go out and discover your own own things and that doesn't mean it has to be particularly complicated even mm. it doesn't at mm. all but just something just anything yeah so that's that's what practice means to me because when i do all the maintenance stuff on top yeah and then and then that's that stuff happens in band rehearsals and the decap rehearsals. I make sure I know the songs or the yeah. Vader rehearsals, whatever. I make sure I know everything. I'm not not the weakest link in that group, yeah, or anything. But for me, practice means actually finding new things and dis mm. and discovery. And you know, the practicing things for. The things that are coming up that's that's important but that falls under maintenance for me yeah, unless it's yeah. something unless it's something totally new yeah like creating something for uh for an album creating a part for a session or whatever yeah. then then it falls under <clears throat> practice yeah and you're you're still discovering but if you're just if i'm if i know that i've got a vader show next week then i'm gonna practice the vader material that's that falls under maintenance for me Mm. rather than because i'm reminding myself of things i already know and can already do yeah, yeah yeah of course you know and that's that's where the discovery aspect comes in yeah and so that's that's why i think it's it's really important to draw the line between practice and, and maintenance mm. yeah i like that that makes a lot of sense that's uh and it, but that, i mean and I, I totally agree these days when i kind of play 
quote unquote, I kind of just sit down and fuck around. And jam. And then, yeah, I've seen and them. Then... Yeah, I've seen your Instagram jams. <laughs> your Insta jams. <laughs> and that's kind, of what, that's kind of what I do these days because, you know, I don't really have that much of a of a goal at the moment. I'm not really doing anything outside of just playing and just finding something that I, I fuck around until I stumble. And then I'll be like, oh, yeah. oh, what was that? I'll work on that. I'll try and make that better so I don't stumble. Right. I am going to do this. I do this silly little quiz at the end where it's, you know, the either or Go game. On. Actually, no. I'd say two things and you have to tell me which one you prefer out of the two. All right. Super easy. There's no right or wrong answer. It's what, it's what you like. So <laughs> There is definitely a right or wrong answer. <laughs> Setting you up. Uh, right. Cool. So coffee or tea? Coffee. Yeah, I, I I knew that was going to be the the one. Yeah. Do you ever drink tea ever? Yeah, I do. I used to. I man, I was oh, you used to have tea with milk, as you said. Yeah. Yeah, I was drinking tea Polish since, <laughs> since I was two years old. Yeah, but then I kind of um started drinking coffee at first to get through shows. <laughs> Seriously, and then and then got accidentally Hooked. addicted. Yeah. And now, as especially, if I can I can do tours without alcohol, but I can't do them without coffee. Wow, respect. Yeah, I could I could totally respect that man. Yeah, it's it's part it's kind of becomes part of you, doesn't it? <laughs> I don't I don't do tours without alcohol or coffee, but I could. <laughs> but you could do with one without one. Yeah, <laughs> cool. Right. So morning or evening? Evening. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Fair. Summer or winter? Summer. Yeah. You don't like anything actually, about winter. I fucking hate both. Actually, summer's <laughs> too hot and winter's too cold. <laughs> But summer, summer is my birthday and festivals. True, the time when you get no sleep and you you take over 30, fl- 30 flights. <laughs> yeah, and and also gratification. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I mean, you get to do that that hour of amazingness a lot. So that's uh, yeah, that's cool. Cool, right? So this is a three part one: beach, countryside, or city. Oh, city. Yeah. Oh, yeah. interesting. City guy. No. I- Man, I, I lived in Brighton. Fuck the yeah. beach. Yeah. Don't no. <laughs> Fuck the beach. <laughs> Bournemouth is even worse. Yeah, Bournemouth is pretty like, grim. Sat, yeah. Like I I can't, no. Countryside, yeah, fine. But who's where are you going to get your Amazon deliveries? <laughs> <It's true. laughs> it's all about the city, dude. This is all pragmatic. I like it. I like it. <laughs> right. So YouTube or Netflix? Tough one. It is. It is. It's like Stranger Things or George Kylie's instructional videos. Exactly. Um, that is literally it. <laughs> it's the question I'm asking you right I now. always I used to fucking watch Netflix while I was practicing. I'm gonna go with Netflix. Okay. Fair enough. I like that. Um London or Warsaw? I'm gonna say Warsaw, actually. Ooh. From the I'm not outside, a big fan of it seems like a very beautiful city. I've never really spent much time there, but it's not. Is it not? No, it's from not. The, unless from anyone from Warsaw is I've listening, seen. and it's fine. But <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> Any specific reason then? I get. I just feel a bit more at home in Warsaw these days. I played a lot in uh, Progressia Club. You, for sure, you played. In oh, absolutely! Yeah, yeah. Um, great place. It's a really yeah. It's a really killer club. I like London, but also I really don't like being there that much mm, i know what it's, you mean it's it's really crowded stressful i always feel stressed uh, yeah, in london it is um and it's it is kind of you feel like you're sort of at the center of one of the centers of the world a little bit when you're mm, there mm. but there's that well there's a weight on you almost isn't there there's a there's a reason why i never made a choice to live there and live yeah. away from there I, I, Red, I reading totally is good agree with that yeah, Reading it's just, is far, like anywhere, it's just far out enough, isn't it, Reading? Definitely. Anywhere within commuting distance of London is fine. But yeah. if you actually have to fucking live there, no way. <laughs> I totally agree, dude. It's my worst nightmare living in London. The thought of it just makes me... Ugh. What, £900 for a studio flat? No, thank you. Yeah, just for a bedroom. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, I think I know the answer to this one. I don't even know why I added it on. Cats or dogs? Oh, well, I, I thought you'd go cats. straight for cats. I thought you'd just be a straight up cat I do. guy. I am a cat guy, but I'm allergic to them. Yeah, I remember you saying. <laughs> so obviously I well. have two of them. Yeah. I, of course. Of course I do. 
um but i i yeah man i I love cats but i love dogs as well i'm not very good with dogs because uh i never never had any pets growing up but cats are easier if you've never had pets yeah yeah because they you can just sense. leave them absolutely you just you feed them and then leave them alone and that's it that's all they want <laughs> and you can you can have a a, a loving relationship with a cat just on just those by doing that absolutely <laughs> Whereas, whereas dogs need a lot of attention. Um, okay. Coke or Pepsi or neither? I'm a Pepsi. I used to be a Coke guy, but I'm actually a Pepsi guy now. You're a Pepsi guy, really? I'm a Pepsi guy, yeah. Oh, any specific reason? What switched you? Um, I think, you know what? You can kind of taste the ginger in it. What, the Pepsi? Yeah. It's, I've always noticed it's got a different aftertaste to Coke. Is that ginger? <laughs> Has it got ginger extract in it or something? I mean, maybe, but I feel, <laughs> I feel like there's a kind of gingery taste. I just, I hated it for ages because for, for me, it was, it's like, yeah, it's all about Coke. But yeah, it, I just got a bit sick of it. I think. Something took, fair enough. Fair enough. I, like, I think I, you're I the think first person also, so far that said that. <laughs> so respect. <laughs> And also, it's years of having, because when you when you tour with Polish bands, you drink vodka and then the chaser, and the chaser is quite often Coke. Yeah, 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 of course. So now uh, all I can, when I think about Coke, I just have like you can just taste vodka, flash, and backwash. Oh god! <laughs> yeah, so stick, just... stick to Pepsi. That would do it for anybody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I, I will. I will totally drink drink Coke. But actually, if I have the choice these days, I'll go for Pepsi. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. I think it's got more caffeine than Coke as well. Oh, and as we've just discussed, caffeine being part of the bloodstream. <laughs> Essential. Yeah, exactly. The more caffeine, the better across the board. Right. Um, the, the story in the, or the, the phrase of the day always in the, in the studio is no coffee, no blast. <laughs> it's, a, it's a biological need, I think, isn't it? No. Yeah, just fucking, if there's no coffee, I'm. Not, Not gonna even blast. sitting behind the drums. <laughs> that should be a T-shirt. You should make your own merch. <laughs> right. Um, crisps or chocolate? These days, it's crisps. Mm. It really is. Especially lockdown. Lockdown has, has sent me on a, yeah, on a crisp rampage. <laughs> Any specific type? I like the salted ones. Just ready salted. Yeah, dude. Ready salted, but... But then you know you can you can throw on some guacamole. Yeah, you could ready salted are dippable. That's yeah. the great thing about ready salted. It's like a blank canvas, isn't it? You can do whatever the fuck you yeah. want. Yeah, but you yeah. can't you can't do that with salt and vinegar. It's true. You just guarantee. Well, I mean, also salt and vinegar are horrible, but you're guaranteed <laughs> to make flavored crisps worse by dipping. Yeah. Oh, true. That but is with true. ready salted, it's true. They're only going to get better. I've never thought about it like that. They're yeah. a versatile crisp. <laughs> Really I hadn't thought about this enough. <laughs> You're opening my mind on so many levels. <laughs> oh, I like that. Ready to eat crisps. Cool. Respect. Right. So as, as long as they're with stuff. Okay. So you wouldn't just eat plain ready to eat crisps nonstop. I mean, I I often do. I was going to say, yeah, that's that's, I often that's do. a given. When especially on back, some kind of backstage rider situation. <laughs> I mean, sometimes it's like the only vegan option. Oh God, yeah, being vegan, of course, too. It, it, sometimes it genuinely is. Oh God, yeah. And you're like, "Why are you vegan? Because it's healthier eating a full <laughs> Just bag." Eating really. a full bag. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, yeah. Uh, but don't you understand? It's healthy. <laughs> re- ready salted with a proper chili dip or with a real guacamole. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's like it's the one. Yeah, yeah. super good. Uh, I can respect that. Yeah, that's 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 totally totally cool. Right, these are music related slash drum related. Here we go. Live or studio? Live. Oh, I'm with you, hundred percent. Yeah, totally. I don't even That's, have to ask why. I can, I can, I can respect that fully. You got. You just got the people. You get the, the There's that. There's that whole. There's that feeling mm. of a room full of people or a, or a festival. You f- you just feel the power. Like everybody wants you to do well. They want a good show. Mm. And you want a good you show. You want a good show. Yeah. You're um, all a little bit. It's not the ner- It's not nervous. It's that that kind of back and forward kind of yeah you know, there's this whole, anticipation this whole, so, yeah and there's a sense of communication especially when the gig's going really well you know you feel yeah. it 
it's all you're not you're not even there anymore yeah, yeah. It, like the best gigs you know they're kind of like a flash and then they're done already yeah yeah, yeah. but you Absolutely. know they were great yeah yeah so so yeah live for me 100 percent. yeah cool festival or club club yeah 100 percent. i agree with you there club. for similar reasons f- i guess 100 people in a room all on top of you it's yeah. the best fucking feeling energy it's not very covid not very covid friendly these days but <laughs> yeah i wonder what that's going to be like when we get back to it man you know what I, my favorite gigs are always like the sold out 100 club Mm. 100 capacity club 150 people actually in there yeah, yeah, yeah. just drift, like to- sweat, total chaos the roof. yeah <laughs> no no space like the drum the stage is like a glorified drum riser yeah, basically. yeah. There's <laughs> yeah. No, no space for anything yeah and always it's the best sound yeah absolutely i totally um, agree and it just you feel the energy from people it's like 40 degrees in there yeah humid uh, it's, as it's fuck just, yeah it's <laughs> It's just the best. Slippery There's pedals. no way. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's... Yeah, and then like, I come off stage and my jeans weigh more than I do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it's... It's just... It's just the best. It just yeah. is so good. It's what it's all about. It's such it? a satisfying gig. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Totally agree. Right. This one is often controversial. European tour or US tour? It's not controversial. It's a European tour, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not no. fucking controversial and then US bands come over and complain about the EU catering and you're like what <laughs> well in the US there is no catering so it's not a comparison no, I mean if you're a headliner <laughs> you get beer yeah, yeah exactly and a buyout of like five dollars and you're in the, in an industrial estate <laughs> no I, w- I will say the last the last tour I did in the US with Vader was really really good mm. Continental did a fucking amazing job the shows were good the catering was actually pretty good mm. And uh, the buyouts were good too, but on, the on, whole, on balance, yeah, on balance, absolutely. I've done more good European tours than I have done good US tours. They've, yeah. they've always been good for crowd. They've always been fun. Yeah, but there is a sense of sort of gypsiness oh, that, about it. Oh, that's the thing. And and you know, just to clarify, there's nothing to be said negatively about American uh, or US crowds. It's the treatment of the artist in in the US, I think, which is tougher than the treatment of the artist in europe <laughs> yeah and I, I did a bunch of european tours before my, and also you have to get visas to go there and it's all mm. a bit of a uh, it's it's really expensive mm. and so it's always been it's always a stress and a struggle the shows are great but but everything around is just so tough and the journey's are long as fuck as well yeah i agree i agree i'm with so, you yeah eu is it's just guaranteed to be way easier it's like second home almost especially for guys like us who have been in european bands and yeah exactly you you know that you know that it's just 100 quid and uh, for a flight back home yeah exactly (laughs) if you need to if you really hate it you can just go home in a couple (laughs) hours right so another controversial one although i think i probably know the answer blast or groove That that's actually a really tough one, because oh. there is nothing like a really killer blast beat in the right place. That's true, or a very well played blast beat as well. It's always lovely to hear. Yeah, yeah. I I do like. I really like both. I do. It depends on context. That one. I'm going to say blast because it's just it's metal. <laughs> it's, a, it's metal and it's also it's really exciting if you've never heard a blast before yeah and then suddenly you hear um actually i remember people equal shit was one of the first ever blasts i heard wow yeah makes sense i guess and that's that's a really exciting like the very beginning it's so exciting yeah and no clicks and it constantly the fucking tempo's all over the place in a good and also way you, you've probably never heard the snare on a 30 second note offbeat before. <laughs> yeah. So it's really confusing. It's really disorientating but there's it's kind of it's just like a this really powerful distorted guitar tone as well. There's something about it, double kick, all of that stuff. There's something about it that stands the hair on the back of my neck up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. just something really inherently exciting about all of it. Mm. Maybe because it sounds like it's about to fall apart in Yeah, there. yeah. Yeah. Which is um, going back to what we were saying before is is what a lot of music's all about. <laughs> it's but then, about that. But then 
you know, when you, when you say groove, I think you know, like Gojira, Slayer, exactly. All those. There's. It doesn't Pantera. mean it can't can't be powerful. Yeah. Mm. But I'm gonna I'm gonna say blast because it's the extreme. Yeah. Drama squad pass. <laughs> okay, I like that. <laughs> Keeping on topic. Um. Right. So this one. one this is the last of the uh, drum ones. And we've spoken about it a little bit on this, but I, I, and I don't know if you'll be able to give me a final answer, but direct drive or chain? Because I've spent 10 years on chain, it's got to be chain. It's got to be chain, yeah. It's got to be chain because I think it's, it's also important to learn on the chain, I think. Yeah, 100%. You know, it's... Drummers that are good on direct drive are also good on chain pedals. Mm. And they probably started or, on chain pedals. Or, yeah, or, or drummers that are good on chain pedals will be fine on direct drive, but it's not necessarily the other way around, is mm. what I meant to say before mm. I completely fucked that up. <laughs> but <laughs> but I, I think chain is a much more transferable skill. Mm. Mm. Much more and universal. And there's, there's a lot of drummers that I've seen on YouTube and stuff where I'm like, yeah, you couldn't do that on yeah. a chain drive pedal. You know? yeah. yeah, absolutely. I think that there is a kind of elitism there, mm. but if you go, and it's, it's one of my, one of my general attitudes to gear really is you should be able to do it on the lowest common denominator. Yeah, totally. Cause if you can do it on like on some South American style backline or whatever, yeah, you can fucking do it. Yeah. You know, but, um, but generally, these what I've noticed, especially about certain a younger breed of metal drummer, is that they're on really expensive equipment very early. Yeah, yeah, it's the accessibility, I think, isn't it? Like we didn't, it is. we didn't I remember, have the access oh, to gosh, this stuff yeah. when we were. You could, there was only access, and you had to order them from the US. And yeah, whoever remember. you bought them from had you to had say to call that they were, them, didn't you? As well, you couldn't buy them online. I did. To... I did it on eBay. Oh, you did it on eBay. Okay, yeah. But then whoever sent them to you had to you had to tell customs it was a gift. Otherwise you'd have to pay more in customs <laughs> fees. Oh god. You'd have to pay more in, in customs fees than for the actual pedals, which are already expensive and yeah. custom made and yeah. all this shit. <laughs> it was it was a fucking nightmare trying to get a hold of access. So most yeah. people just went, you know what? I'm not gonna do it. I'll just do Iron Cobra, yeah, exactly. And now now that's not the case, you know, now you can get them anywhere. Absolutely, yeah. And um that's that's fine. That's just technology. But mm. also I think there's something to be said for the, the best pedals out there possible, single chain. Like the the original Pearl double oh, kick pedal. Yeah, uh, fucking P one ten P one oh one P or whatever it is. Yeah, that was yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That the was first, a good pedal, dude. I remember that. It's one. really good. It's really it's good. really good. It's yeah. fucking stands up even yeah. now. And actually, the uh, the Mapex ones as well, the Mapex single chain, with the, they're really good. I don't think I ever played one of those. I also, I because I learned the ones on the, that are in every practice room ever. Oh, with the tri, with the triple yeah, beta. Yeah. Oh yeah, I remember those. Yeah, um, they're actually the really good. Iron Cobra Juniors really weren't bad. I learned on those, so and like I spent the first three or four years of my metal playing on yeah, me just too, single me, chain I, Iron Cobras. <laughs> I was on the I was on the the, the pearls for forever. Mm for a really really long time the like the entry level pearls yeah and then uh for my like 16th birthday or something i convinced my parents to let me upgrade to the pearl eliminators yeah yeah and i hated them did you wow i hated them i used so them for much. years yeah i mean i used them for years i got into them afterwards but yeah. for, like my initial reaction was like i've upgraded to like the premium top level pedal this is going to be amazing hated it Wow. Hated it so much. I was like, this is so easy and so light and so fast. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. It's just a different I got, experience. That's why I think I took to the Iron Cobra so much on like maximum tension because I got used yeah. to the pedal fighting you every step yeah, of the way down. Yeah. 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 Having um, to really put your all into it. But that was a much more transferable way than if I'd started with Eliminators and tried to go on to something else. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. As you so, say, the lowest common denominator kind of aspect of it. Yeah, totally. If you can make the worst equipment sound feel good, then you're you're pro you you're pro. You're on for a 
you know, you're able to survive any gig. Yeah, yeah after absolutely. That. absolutely. I totally agree with that. Totally agree with that. I'm going to do this last thing. And this is a top three. I do a to- top different, three. Top, to different top three every week. And I try to make them a little bit funny and unique. So yeah, top, sure. Top three British venues. <laughs> oh. Boom. And then we're done. All right. But I'm going to have to, I can't say, I can't say classically good ones. Okay. Because that's too that's too yeah, easy. Yeah, it's too obvious, yeah. Because there's there's all too the academies obscure. and stuff like that. They're great. Yeah. Obviously. I think we all know what the number one has to be. What's your number one? The underworld. <laughs> yeah, it has to be, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. It's just, it does. Initially it's just, I was like, mm, Brixton Academy? Uh and then I thought, no, fuck that. Underworld, dude. Un- underworld all the way. Underworld is Underworld is the Kingmaker Club. Absolutely. It Absolutely. just is, you know, if yeah. yeah. If you if you can sound really good in there, put on a really good show in there and have a crazy sh- like it means it means something. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Totally agree. The underworld is one of those clubs where if you can if you can rock the underworld, it really means something. Yeah. So and also the 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 venue's not up to much, but the local crew in there are great. Oh, they're amazing, yeah. Totally, it's just I totally agree. It's just such an established venue. It, it couldn't take, it couldn't not be number one, really. Yeah, could it? yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, completely agree. And I, I want to try and avoid like classically good venues. So I want to try and oh, oh, what is it? Is it the White Horse in High Wycombe? Oh, I've Hold never that. been there. I've never been there, but I know. I think it is the White Horse. Yeah. I know the name, the, but I've never been there. Because Arch Enemy have played like loads of amazing bands have played there. Yeah, because it's it's um it's close to DC territory, so we played there a bunch. Uh, okay, played there a load of times, and uh, it's it's uh it's it's actually it's like you go into a pub and you go upstairs and there's actually like this really nice venue hidden upstairs. If it is actually the White Horse, we're going to have to fact check that. Yeah, but, I'll check. But that's actually while you're thinking. But even one, even bands like Opeth and Emperor have played there. Wow, bloody hell! And all that kind of stuff. So it's like all the candlelight bands used to play there on the way up back in the day. So that's a bit so of a kingmaker does... too. Yeah, sort of less so. It's just, but still, Emperor and High Wickham. That's pretty funny. Um, this is too hard. I thought this would be easy. This is a this is a. It's hard not. It's three. really not. You know what? It's it's not a UK venue. But I am gonna. I'll allow I'm it. gonna give it. <laughs> I'm gonna give it the top spot. Is the Voodoo Lounge in Dublin? Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. All right. I'll give you. If that. I called that a UK venue, I would get lynched. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. But it's um. It's relatively you know, you close do, to home. Yeah. You do it as part of the UK tour. Yeah. Always. Exactly. You know yeah. or. Certainly used to UK and Ireland, yeah, uh, yeah. You'd always yeah, that's a cool place, the, man. The Voodoo Lounge is so so fun to do. I've always had a good show in there. Mm. I've done it. We did it with Divine Chaos supporting Sodom. Wow, and that nice. was it was just rammed out. Yeah, it was so good. Um, and f- and did it with uh, Decapitated once, and did it with Vader a million times, and so it's um. Yeah, it's, it's we're gonna have to we're gonna have to go outside of the UK for that one, but Dublin yeah. wins it. No, yeah, Dublin really that. does. That's, that's three good ones, man. That's three really good ones. Again, I thought that'd be easier than it was, but um, uh, but we got there. Well, it was good fun. It was, man. Thank you so much for thank you so much for being involved, and thank you so much for joining yeah, no me. No problem. And taking the time out and getting we got very nerdy. We uh, laughed a lot. Um, but hopefully it was rambly enough and interesting enough. Exactly, I'm sure it will be. People love to listen to nerdy drum chats. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> but uh, yeah, seriously, man, thank you so much. Thank you for taking the time. Yeah, out. no problem, man. Thanks and, for asking uh, me. It was uh, yeah, it was good fun. Yeah, we'll right. keep in touch, man. And thank you again. Yeah, all the best. And uh, yeah, speak to you soon. Thanks, dude. Have a good one. Yeah, yeah. Good Cheers, man. man. Bye. Bye. <laughs>